Good morning. Welcome back to my Metal Gear Solid V Explained Lecture Series. I'm Ross Weaver. This will be lecture number 11 in the series where I go over missions 21 and missions 22. Uh, the War Economy and Retake the Platform. So, let's get started. When we get into Mission 21 for the first time when we're playing the Phantom Pain, we get a big old alert that, and you can't even really do the mission the first time because if you don't do this alert, there's consequences. Um, essentially, you get an alert before you can even sneak onto Nova Braga Airport. Kaz tells you that somebody has attacked our base and, and taken a whole strut arm uh, captive and has taken several hostages and we basically got somebody on our base who's taken it over so practically speaking in the in the level of the gameplay itself this really is just the introduction to the multiplayer aspect of the game the FOB mode you can't do the FOB mode up until this point in the game when you've come af until after you've completed mission 22 so we'll talk about 22 first, and then I'll go back and talk about 21. Uh, since the game kind of wants you to experience it that way, we'll we'll stick to it. Because if you you can't ignore uh, Kaz's call and then just not do anything, do the mission, and then come back to base, but then you'll get the whole. Uh, I th oh, I th I think you get the whole cutscene that they show after you get uh, your base attacked, possibly. Oh no no that 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 comes later after your base after after your first FOB invasion from another player there's a cutscene kind of like this where Kaz calls you back to the base and then you look around and there's just like a lot of activity going on people being carted around you know uh, we've been attacked and we're trying to figure out who did it and Kaz says it's one of our competitors it's it's another version of us essentially. And that goes back to the whole Venom Snake stands in for more than just who he is on a sort of like a, you would say a primary level, as in who he was in the universe between 1986 and 1995. In other words, those events that he literally does symbolically stand in for the same events that other snakes do at other times and other time periods. That's that's kind of the overarching thing that's supposed to be going on. So you can kind of just take that nine years from 86 to 95 and shrink it or maybe stretch it out a little bit and apply it to other foxes or other uh, like other past versions of fox or other snakes even probably uh, like solidus and maybe even vamp i've been bringing vamp up a lot vamp is kind of like another snake but he's like he's kind of like python python was like a, a black ops operative for Fo the fox unit but he was also was very similar to the other cobras and he had like parasite powers that probably came from a similar event to, from where the cobras got theirs but he's still alive after the cobras are you know all gone and nobody's really sure what the canon thing is as to what happens with python because in portable ops you're given the choice to either keep him or kill him kind of kind of like quiet and it seems like the canon thing is that Big Boss, or I should say Naked Snake back then, kills Python. But there is a version where you can bring him onto your team, basically. So, And the way that Python's treated is kind of the same way that Vamp gets treated. He's like this black ops guy who's super strong, but had to be separated from the rest of the people that he was like. And he kind of gets used for you know black ops stuff and, and for darker purposes. And the reason I bring up Vamp is because, well, so what's happening in 22, like we've, we've got a guy who's taken our base. He's calling himself Mosquito, and he's part of the Mosquito Stinger Force, another MSF. So this kind of also goes back to the idea that there's, there's sort of like two MSFs. <clears throat> there was the one we knew, excuse me, <clears throat> the one we knew, the the offshore base, you know, the whole happy family and everything from Peace Walker. But then there's this other side of MSF, the onshore base, which <clears throat> we never really got to see. And so this this idea of this other side of MSF is kind of this idea of the, maybe even like the, you could think of it as the other side of Diamond Dogs even. And like maybe Diamond Dogs is a bigger organization and we're just running one part of it 
that we think is the whole thing, but there's a whole other part of it that's separated from it that also thinks it's the whole thing. And by having those two separate parts running in parallel, you can kind of, to other people who are looking into Diamond Dogs, you can kind of do some tricky stuff, you know? And so that tricky stuff is, I think, kind of part of what's going on to us here, essentially. <clears throat> because this this guy, Mosquito, who's shown up, well, what do mosquitoes do? They're, they're blood suckers. They're kind of like vampires. So I've been throwing around this idea of vamp, but this, this could even be, you could think of this as a mosquito as a symbol for a few different possibilities. And I, I again, I don't want to tell you which one to believe, but personally... I kind of see it as, uh, since we've just rescued those five kids, if the one that I thought was Vamp was maybe George or Solidus, then this makes sense that at the war, or at uh, Retake the Platform, that <clears throat> Vamp is probably the one who's taken our platform from us, and we got to get it back from him. Um, there's also maybe a possibility where it's Vamp is one of the five that we rescue at the mine, <clears throat> And Solidus is the one who takes this platform from us. Um, you know, maybe Solidus rescues Snake in uh, uh, Lingua Franca, sort of the symbolic Lingua Franca back then. <clears throat> and then maybe he has to, like, go back to, to doing his own thing and never gets to, never really tells Ishmael what's going on back then, maybe, possibly. There's a few different ways this could, you know, this could all fit. And, uh, like I said, I don't know, there's... There's probably a, 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 a better indication that this is Vamp because of the whole mosquito, blood-sucking, you know, shadow MSF thing. But uh, I'll leave it up to y'all to ultimately try to figure that one out. But <clears throat> in a larger sense, this, this way this happens also, our, our platform is taken, and the way that the PvP kind of works in the game where you're fighting other versions of yourself... And the way that Venom Snake is both Snake and Boss, this is kind of all a proxy for the struggle between Boss and Snake that's been going on at this point. So you can imagine, like, you know, Boss has got this onshore base, and Snake's been just having a field day infiltrating it like crazy. He hasn't been having any problems back at his own base, so finally Boss sends an infiltrator to his base. And so now there's maybe kind of this dual thing where you have to defend your own base and attack the enemies. And so that's all kind of tied in together with, uh, I think, why this is happening right here in the war economy. Um, I really think that, and I'll get to it when we get back to the war economy, but I really think it makes the most sense that you could consider Mosquito kind of like Vamp. And uh, those five Foxhound kids, kind of just symbolic representations of the future Foxhound. Since, you know, since this is happening in... The phantom pain, the way we're seeing it. Maybe the five is, you know, just a symbol, and we didn't, uh, and Frank, back in the 70s, didn't literally rescue five Foxhound members at first. Maybe maybe it was a little little bit different for him. Uh, the last thing I want to mention as to mission 22, and then we'll move back to 21, is that the number 22 is going to come up a few times. Uh, I'm going to bring it up. It doesn't really come up in the game, it's 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 here with this mission, uh, but 22 stands in, I think, for kind of a reference to Peace Day. We know Peace Day never came, if you've listened to all the pause tapes. And, uh, well, heck, I'll just go back to it. I think what happened was Zadornov and uh, Zadornov was really Ocelot, and Pause is really kind of like the transformed version of the Joy. They're working together against Big Boss because they know Big Boss is about to do his whole mutiny thing. It's probably going to be really bad for the whole organization. So they're going to... Uh, Ocelot's going to distract him a whole bunch by escaping his cells as a doorknob and blah, blah, blah. And Paws is going to go reconfigure Zeke so that she can hijack it and use it to fight Boss and stop him. And we're not really sure exactly when this happens. We're, we're given a bunch of dates and ground zeros of uh, March, but that that doesn't really, like I said, it doesn't really fit with me. Um, if we know that the Peace Walker operation was going on in 74, and let's say it ended at, you know, sort of like the tail end of 74, then I think that post-game stuff that happens in Peace Walker was probably happening in like the end of 74 and into the beginning of 75. So probably like November, December, 
74, maybe January of 75. was when all that was taking place. And so the best I can figure is that Peace Day was probably going to be a date that they had made up. Um, since, you know, they're, they're a nation unto themselves and they don't really follow any other kind of, you know, uh, any other culture, any other system of living, right? They're not, maybe they'll have like stuff like Christmas and a few other things, but I think they wanted to have their own holiday that, that's, that was like, we're going to take one day off a year, essentially. And so they, when they tried to figure out what day that was going to be, well, what would you base that on? A, a peace day, right? The only, the only really existing thing that I think of when I think of peace day is, is V day, really, which is 1111, um, armistice day. It was when World War One ended. But you can't you can't use that because that's already being used for World War One, you know, Armistice Day. So Peace Two. So maybe they used February twenty second. I don't know. I've got other reasons why I think it's February twenty second, and I I can't go into it here. It's just ooh, it's a whole thing. But uh that that would imply that this whole Zeke incident happened three days before the 22nd. So, uh, 22, 21, 20, 19. It would have been uh, February 19th, probably, is when the Zeke incident happened, which would have put all of the, the Camp Omega stuff happening right after that in late February. Uh, because we know Paz survived, and it was 10 days. After, she was probably tortured for 10 days, so... That would have put that would have put the, the the ending of the whole thing really in like early March, and so that's why I think the dates that were given start after that, and it's a way of just like placing it like right after the event, and so you kind of it's it's like the, sort of like the easiest way to cover up something is to just shove it a day or two you know ahead of time or something like that, uh, kind of like how sometimes they try to. Uh, cover up murders by making it seem like the the person died at a later time or an earlier time by manipulating you know, conditions and things like that. And that's kind of what's going on here, I think, with the date. So, okay, that's enough for Mission 22. Let's go back to 21. The war economy. Now, this is getting into, the, like I said, the bigger shell game going on here. After Frank has tracked down Boss's operation and probably kind of burned down his whole oper- his whole parasite making thing. Um, or maybe Boss burned it down himself and Frank was too late to get there. That's probably more likely uh, because Boss had already gotten what he needed. He, Like I said, he probably just really needed like the uh, the essence of the, the Parasite soldier's genetics and then he could use that to make his own drones and and sort of sell. You know, I think he was going to sell them because what what's happening in the war economy? Well, there's this CFA official that comes and visits Nova Braga Airport, and he has a whole meeting with the, the head of the the, P, the the unit there. The two of them walk around the airport, inspect it, have a whole tour and conversation. And for the mission tasks, you got to spy on the whole conversation. So the CFA are just, you know, the contract forces of Africa. They're just kind of a general PF in the area. And they're depicted as kind of being on the bad side of this conflict in, in, in the way that we're approaching it. And and really it's uh, uh, the MPLA, you know, that we kind of see as the good guys. But in a way, the CFA are kind of neutral and they're just kind of hired out. and They, they don't really necessarily have like a good or bad thing going on themselves. Um, and, I, and I say that because this guy who's the head of this CFA unit... Um, has a, has some more similarities to Fox himself, to, to Venom Snake, really, uh, as the head of Diamond Dogs. If you could think of the CFA as kind of a metaphorical Diamond Dogs, then this guy who's the head of the CFA is, and not the president, the president's another guy, we'll get to him, but the, the, the black guy with the armor on. That's kind of like another version of, of Snake. Um, so in the way that Retake the Platform just had this guy who I think was Vamp, you know, coming after us, you could almost consider this guy in the war economy almost like another Vamp or another another copy of Snake. But the black guy's probably not Solidus. He's probably just a symbolic stand-in for yourself. Um, because the CFA president who comes and visits, well, who's the only character in Metal Gear that we know of 
who's like, who's the first one you think of as the president? It's George Sears, right? We know James Johnson was also a president, and I have said in my video, I think James Johnson was another copy of, or another cover for Zero, another identity for him. But it kind of doesn't make sense that this would be Zero. If, uh, if Frank was infiltrating like an airport, say back in 75 or 76, uh, this probably would have been 76, and he's seeing like a symbolic, you know, a copy of him, which back then it was probably just another... Uh, another soldier that Big Boss had put in his in like the commander place, you know, another version of Snake that Big Boss had made. He might have been like a just some random soldier, you know, who had just gone up through the ranks and was just at you know he he was just the next one shoved into the the commander position because it, eh, you know the CFAs they're just kind of a PF now. They're not really as important it seems. So maybe that was what was going on back then. Um. But this president guy that shows up, it, I really believe that this guy is there as a stand-in for Solidus. And, you know, yeah, Solidus was born in 72, but like I said, I think he was born as the full-grown version of Naked Snake. Because I think uh, Cypher took Snake's DNA in either 70 or 71, and then grew Solidus from that DNA. They didn't... And Solidus was made in, using a different method than Solid and Liquid were made from. So Solid and Liquid, I think, were like born as like babies and had to actually grow up. But Solidus being made was maybe more akin to like some kind of accelerated growth deal where he was born as a small baby, but then like within a couple of years, he was like a full grown adult and had gone through puberty and had aged and had maybe even had slightly graying hair by he by the time he was like two or three years old. Um, but th that would so that would set him up as a good position for being the guy who's like this weapons dealer behind the CFA stuff. Um, also, he's a missile guidance specialist. So he's here, and we'll learn later, he's like setting up nuclear uh, weapons trading, and he's a missile guidance specialist. So like missiles, nuclear missiles, it's, it seems like this guy is, he's into, he's very knowledgeable about nuclear stuff. And that's, you know, that's bad, but I also think the nuclear stuff is there just as, sim it's more symbolism. Um, as we've pointed out the whole time, the, the nuclear thing really here is Big Boss's new super soldiers, which are made from manipulating, you know, stuff on the atomic level, so you could say it's kind of nuclear, right? Uh, because the parasites are quantum level stuff that manipulate stuff on the atomic level, and that's, it kind of makes it, you know, sort of nuclear. So this nuclear weapons trading that they're setting up, and they're, you see they're selling the kits. They're not even selling the, the, the fully constructed deal. So they're selling a kit so that other, you, other uh, forces and other entities can put together their own little super soldiers. But then Skullface, we know Skullface intends to retain control of his weapons that he sells, so that, that means Big Boss probably intended to sell these drones, these parasite drones, to other people and let them use them but then he would retain control of them so that at any point he could go back in and just take them back. I think Big Boss wanted to do that because that's what Zero had been doing to him. And I think that's why he wanted control of the Foxhound soldiers and, and you know, why he, just where this whole idea came from. So the nuke trading is really symbolic of the super soldier trading and the hangar locations are a little spooky if you if you listen to the conversations um you go to the first hangar which is to your north from the where the meeting place first starts and you start talking about this hangar he calls it the south hangar and then when they go later on to the south hangar which is it's south on your map they call it the north hangar so you have here in the game evidence of characters perceiving it as differently than what you're perceiving it as. Which I think is just another method of control and refers back to how, remember I said uh, the Afghanistan map is our base, but the quarantine platform is like turned 180 degrees. Well, north is south. There you go. And we get the proof here, basically. 
Um, and you can go in and listen to yourself, or you can go check out I'm, on my other channel. I've got a video. It's all mission tasks and spies on the conversation, and you can check it out yourself if you want to just do that. Um, let's see what else is there. Ah, inside the airport, if when you're spying on their first conversation, um, you'll notice the interior of the airport is painted a certain color, kind of this teal, kind of not quite blue, not quite green. You know, it's just another example of the teal color that I've been talking about, and it was in Voices. It was in. Uh, mission 18 on the the cell bars it's it's in a few it's in quite a few little places in this whole game they hide it in some places but usually it's pretty like it's obvious and they hide it in plain sight more than they do in some corner or something like that and then again i think it re the the teal color really relates to the parasite's power and the power of transformation uh in portable ops elisa when she's or maybe you could consider her ursula but when she's shown as using her psychic powers, she has a kind of a teal aura. It's kind of that Selino Yarsk color. Also, this mission has some later connections that we'll get back to later, to Mission 41, Proxy War Without End. Um, this idea of the CFA commander being another snake is kind of reinforced there later, which I'll, I'll just have to get to that later. But I also want to mention there's a version of this mission. The CFA president comes on a helicopter, and then the helicopter tours the, or patrols while they tour the facility. When they're done touring, they both get into the helicopter and leave. And once that happens, well, your objective is to, to kill the, uh, the CFA commander and or kidnap the, him and the president. I think you have to kill them both and or the president, but... Oh, no, no, it's just the CFA commander that you have to kill, actually. Um, or kill or kidnap. But uh, you can let them both get into the helicopter, let it fly off, and then shoot it down in kind of a repeat of the whole Ground Zero scenario where you could consider the president as like Zero and the other guy as like Snake. Like the old man and, and, and Snake were in the helicopter when it went down. So that's... Another way of us getting to confirm this, you know, layers upon layers of the same scenario repeating over and over again. And that's, again, proxy war without end. This is setting that up. So the war economy and the proxy wars and all of this stuff is all tied together. And the, and the nuclear weapons trading, as in like the, the parasite being weaponized and used for schemes to control the world. Um... So the, you also have to pick up these precious metal metals containers in the south hangar uh, as one of your mission tasks. And you can't do it the first time you do this mission because they're inside the hangar and you have Fulton balloons. You don't have the, the wormhole Fulton until much later in the game. So in a way, this game's telling you that the way you're doing it the first time is not really the way it was done by Ishmael. In other words, you, you the first time you play through this game, you won't be given all of the stuff that you need to sort of accurately recreate these scenarios for what they were originally symbolically standing in for. In other words, you kind of have to complete the whole game first and then go back and do it from the start with everything from the start in order to really see this game the way it's supposed to be seen, in order to be able to experience everything and get all the mission tasks in one go and then still get the S rank and stuff like that. So these precious metals containers... You know, you have to wormhole them out. And I think the precious metals relates back to um, the metals being like the enriched uranium that we find in back in the Trader's Caravan inside the yellow cake, the thin layer. That enriched layer of yellow cake is kind of equivalent to like the parasites, you know, enrichment powers. It's, it's the precious metals. The diamonds be, uh, are sort of made from this same process. You can think of the diamonds as the same thing as this enriched yellow cake. It's like the, uh, it's the good stuff. Um, and then finally, in this last conversation that you can hear, the last part of their conversation... It seems that there's a little bit of a separation, you know, between this president figure and the head of the CFA column here, or the head of the, the, the commander of the forces here. He's uh, it seems that he's been kind of looking into some stuff himself, 
which I think ties him right back to the, the transport truck driver and voices. They're both kind of curious guys, and they're investigating what all's going on here. And uh, they talk about the gunsmith and the children going on and experiments at the devil's house. Excuse me. Now, the gunsmith and the children, is this is a really important thing. And it kind of can slip by and go unnoticed by most players if you don't really pay attention to it. But I'll get into it more in the very next video when we talk about White Mamba. But this gunsmith... It's probably Sigand. Because we know Drebin is the weapons expert in Metal Gear Solid 4. And Drebin is also an expert at hacking SOP and hacking just all of the Patriot systems. And he says it's always oh, just a little thing I can do, blah, blah, blah. And he's totally bullshitting us. <laughs> he's, he's, he's giving us a line. That's probably Sigand. Um, Donald Anderson. And this gunsmith is probably like another reference to Donald Anderson, if not Anderson himself. And so these children are kind of in his care, and they're the ones who move in after the language virus is released in an area. And his children are immune to the virus. And so in that way, they're able to use these children to control the area. And uh, I think that relates back to Big Boss's whole scheme of, you know, sort of, releasing a threat in an area possibly that was really his threat and then he would sell the solution to that threat to the people who were being threatened by it which were his probably his drone soldiers with the exoskeletons but he can, he had control of everything there so he's he's essentially i think scamming people and using that to create war economies all over the world first in rhodesia and so that's why we're here tracking him down and so the gunsmith and the children and the experiments all are tied in with all this and um and the parasite, you know, the super soldiers and all that. So that's all I've got for missions twenty one and twenty two. Uh, next time, for missions twenty, for mission twenty three, we're gonna learn more about Chico because Eli is Chico, like another copy of him. We'll probably do missions twenty three and twenty four next time because this stuff is all so tied together. It's just it's more useful for me to be able to talk about stuff kind of overlapping, uh, but. Next one's going to be good. We're going to we're going to get into what's going on behind the curtain even more. Uh, but yeah, so multiple there's there's multiple snakes out here. There's you know recurring layers of the same kind of plan you know, overlapped on onto itself. It's complicated stuff. It's hard to understand. And if you don't quite you know follow me here, it's like I said, it's it's totally cool. I get it. It's this stuff has taken me a while to get to, and I, and I'm still probably not totally 100% understanding everything. Uh, but you know, I don't see anybody else talking about this kind of stuff this way out here right now. So I, I'm I feel like I'm far enough along that I can you know get some of this stuff out there at least and help some of y'all to catch up on what this story's really been doing because this this came out a few years ago and we're just now figuring it out you know <laughs> it's it's kind of crazy uh, but it's lots of fun and i hope you all have enjoyed it too so see you next time peace